Hi everyone. In this section we're going to look at a particular class of functions known as rational functions. This is functions of the form polynomial over another polynomial. And we're going to look at a technique for finding antiderivatives of rational functions. This technique is known as decomposition by partial fractions. So this is where the term partial fractions is coming into the title. So what exactly are partial fractions? Well let's look at this first problem. I want to evaluate this antiderivative. Now what we can do is take the original integrand and try to rewrite it in another way that makes more sense when we're computing antiderivatives. Now what would be another way to write it? Well the denominator I can factor. I can factor that as x minus 2 x minus 3. Now I imagine how could I write this as the sum of two simpler fractions? Two simpler rational functions. What would they be? Well, the denominator is x minus 2, x minus 3. So I could imagine that one of them has the denominator x minus 2 and the other one has denominator x minus 3. Because if I was going to add two rational functions of this form, the result, when combined, would involve a denominator who's the least common multiple of these two denominators, and that would be just their product. So I can imagine that perhaps I can decompose it in this way. If I could decompose it in this way, I would need to find the values of the numerators. What numbers would have to go up there so that the, this decomposition works? Well, in this case, we'll see this in a little bit, uh, how to actually construct these numbers, but we can see in this case that once I write these numbers down, that this will work. So just do a quick check. You know, just do a quick check of this. Are these the right numbers there? Well, if I was to add these two rational functions together, I would have to put them both over a common denominator. So that common denominator would be the product of the two denominators. So that would be negative x minus 3 would be the factor that's missing from this first one, times negative 1, and then plus 2 times the factor that's missing from the second one, which is the x minus 2 and that would be all over the original denominator, which is the least common multiple of these two pieces. And what is this new numerator working out to be? Well, it's negative x plus 2x, so that's x. And that's a 3 minus a 4, which is a negative 1. And all of that is over that original denominator, x minus 2 x minus 3. And that's exactly what we started with. So there our check works out. So these are the actual values of the numerator to get that decomposition. Now have we made progress? Well all we've done here is rewrite the original integrand, the original rational function, as the sum of two simpler ones. Simpler in what sense? Well in one sense they are simpler to integrate because now I can work out the integral by just working out the individual integrals. And in each of these cases, well the first one is a logarithm of x minus 2, and in the second case it's twice the logarithm of the absolute value of x minus 3, and a constant of integration. And so there we go. We can compute the integral of this thing by splitting it up into two simpler pieces and then taking the individual antiderivatives. That's the method of partial fractions. So integration of rational functions is our goal. How are we going to do it? By partial fraction decomposition. We're going to take the original integrand, we're going to decompose it into a bunch of pieces, each piece involving some piece of the original denominator, and integrate term by term. So here's the general formulation of integrating rational functions. The problem is we want to integrate a rational function. Now what happens if the degree of the numerator is bigger than the denominator? So the degree of the thing on top is bigger than the thing on the bottom. Then you do a little bit of long division and write it as a polynomial plus another rational function. Let's just see a quick example of this. So suppose our rational function was 3x cubed plus 7x squared minus 8x plus 2 all over x squared plus 2x minus 3. So there's an example where the degree of the numerator is bigger than the degree of the denominator. So what we would do is we would do a bit of long division. So I want to divide the denominator 
into the numerator. And let's see, how many times does x squared go into 3x cubed? It goes in 3x times. So that gives us a 3x cubed plus a 6x squared minus a 9x. Now we take the difference, 7x squared minus 6x squared, that's just an x squared. Negative 8x minus negative 9, so that's negative 8 plus 9, or that's plus x plus 2. How many times does x squared go into x squared? That's just once. So that's x squared plus 2x minus 3. And now the difference of these two, x minus 2x is negative x, 2 minus minus 3, so that's 2 plus 3, or 5. And there's our remainder. So what this long division tells us here is that, well, let's just write it out. It tells us that 3x cubed plus 7x squared minus 8x plus 2 is equal to, I'm going to do this in red, is equal to that times that plus that. So this times this plus the remainder. So that's 3x plus 1 times x squared plus 2x minus 3 plus the remainder, negative x plus 5. So our original numerator can be written as a multiple of the original denominator plus a remainder. So that means this thing is equal to, if I take my new expression for that numerator and divide by the old denominator, then it becomes a 3x plus 1, that's that cofactor there, plus the remainder divided by the old denominator. So our original, our original rational function, whose degree was bigger, the numerator had a degree bigger than the denominator, can be written as a polynomial plus a new rational function, where the degree of the numerator is now smaller than the denominator. That's what this is saying here. It's saying start with a rational function, write it as a polynomial plus another rational function whose degree of the numerator is smaller. So we've done that. Here's an example of how you would do that. Now when we go to integrate this, we just need to integrate a polynomial plus this new rational function. So we can integrate the old rational function by integrating a polynomial plus a new rational function where the new rational function has the degree of the numerator smaller than the denominator. So we can focus our attention just on the case where the rational function has degree the degree of the numerator is smaller than the denominator. And so for the purposes of investigating how to integrate these kinds of rational functions, we start with a general fact that says that if you have a polynomial, think of this polynomial as being the denominator, you can always factor it into a product of linear factors, that is factors of the form ax plus b, and or possibly irreducible quadratic factors, that's forms ax squared plus bx plus c, where the discriminant is negative. In other words, there are no real roots to this. It doesn't factor. It doesn't factor anymore over the real numbers. Uh, an example of an irreducible quadratic form would be something like, let's say, x squared plus 1. There's an example of an irreducible. So example. That doesn't factor. It has no roots. It's discriminant. If you look at b squared minus 4ac, uh, a is 1, b is 0, c is 1, so it would be 0 squared minus 4 times 1 times 1, or negative 4, and that's negative, so this thing doesn't factor. That's an example of an irreducible quadratic form. Um, just by way of uh, example here, suppose we did encounter a denominator like that. So I'm looking at something like this integral of 1 over x squared plus 1. Suppose through our arguments that we come down to a form that looks like this and that's now what we're trying to integrate. Remember in the previous example, way up here, when we factored the denominator to linear factors and then wrote it in terms of these partial fractions, each of the integrals produced a logarithm. But this is saying, well, you may have a denominator that's not linear. You may have a quadratic denominator that's irreducible. What can you do there? Well, the thing to realize in this case is this integrates to an arctan. So we could have logarithms coming out of the integral if the denominator was linear. 
We could have arctans coming out if it's an irreducible quadratic. There's a few different options that we could com have coming out of this integral. Okay, so here's our strategy. First, we factor the denominator into linear and irreducible quadratic factors, and then you write the original integrand, the original rational function, into a bunch of sums where the denominators of each piece of the sum is either one of those linear factors raised to a power smaller than or equal to the power of the one that's in the denominator of your integrand. And you do the same thing for your irreducible quadratics. And there the unknowns are the numerators which are going to be linear. And the question is how do we find k, l, and m, these numbers in the new numerators in that decomposition. That's what we're going to focus on. So let's have a look at a bunch of examples. Uh, all of that stuff that we've just mentioned, that's sort of the broad overview. We'll get to the nitty-gritty details in these examples. So I want to integrate this. So our first step is to see if we can rewrite it in a way that's more suitable for integrating. So I go ahead and factor the denominator. There's an x, and then what's left is going to be an x squared plus x minus 2, and that can be written as x plus 2, x minus 1. And there's our numerator. My goal is to break this down into a bunch of terms whose sum is this original function. So what can my denominators be? Well, my denominators have to have a least common multiple of x, x plus 2, x minus 1, and I want to split those things up. So here are my denominators. What are my choices for my numerators? Well, they're going to be numbers, a, b, and c, and that's what we have to find. So how do we find those? Well, I'm going to just illustrate two methods. So the first method, method one. This is for finding a, b, and c. Um, actually, I won't do method one just yet because there's one more thing that's common to both method one and method two, and that is first clear denominators. So 4x squared minus 3x minus 4. Multiply both sides of this inequality by this denominator. So what's left is just the numerator of the thing on the left. And on the right, we get an a times this denominator divided by x. So we can see that the x cancels and the only parts that survive are the x plus 2, x minus 1. And similarly for the next two terms, bx, x minus 1, plus a c, x, x plus 2. Now at this stage, we've got a couple of methods for figuring out what the values of a, b, and c are. Method 1 is a very general uh, method. It just says, well, these are supposed to be two polynomials that are equal. Well, if they're two polynomials that are equal to each other for all x, as this inequality, as the equality implies, then it means that their coefficients have to be equal. So what we'll do is we'll expand the left-hand side. So that's going to be an a x squared plus x minus 2 plus b x squared minus x plus c x squared plus 2x. And then we go ahead and we collect all the coefficients together so that I can start comparing them. So this polynomial on the right is supposed to be a quadratic. What's this coefficient of x squared? Well, there's an a, there's a b, and there's a c, so it's an a plus b plus c. What's the coefficient of x? Well, there's an a coming from the first one, there's a negative b coming from the second one, and there's a 2c coming from the third one. And what about the constant? The constant is, well, there's only one, and it's coming from the negative 2a. Now this is supposed to equal this polynomial. So what that means is that these coefficients have to equal each other. That 4 has to be that. And all the way along. So what that means is this has to equal 4, this has to equal negative 3, and this has to equal negative 4. So we have these three equations now involving the coefficients. This last one here tells us that a has to be 2. Now we can take a being 2 and plug it back into the other one. So I'll look at this equation here. a plus b plus c is 4. But if a is 2, then that means b plus c, b plus c is 2. 
and a minus b plus 2c is negative 3, but a is 2. So that means negative b plus 2c is equal to negative 5. Now I have these two equations. b plus c is 2, negative b plus 2c is negative 5. This tells me that c is 2 minus b. So I can take that, I can plug it into that one, and I get negative b plus 2 times 2 minus b is equal to negative 5. Or in other words, negative b minus 2b, so that's a negative 3b. I get a 4, move it to the other side, that's negative 9. So b is equal to 3. And if b is equal to 3, then c is equal to, so sending that back up there, c is equal to negative 1. And so there are the results. A is 2, B is 3, and C is negative 1. So that's method 1. Just expand everything out, compare coefficients, get a bunch of equations, and then solve them for the missing variables. Method 2, rather than expanding and comparing coefficients, instead we say, well, these two polynomials are supposed to equal each other for all x. So why don't we make some strategic choices for x? That will simplify a lot of the expressions and maybe make one of the variables, a, b, or c, easily seen in terms of its value. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at, again, we're staring at this original relationship. And we're going to make some choices. Well, I want to take x values that make a lot of the stuff go away on the right. In fact, I want to make everything go away involving the b and c and just keep something involving a. So if I look at the terms involving b and c, I see that there's an x in common with both of them, and there's not an x in the term involving an a. So if I took x to be 0 and plugged it into the equation, I get the left-hand side evaluates to negative 4. The right-hand side evaluates to 2 times negative 1, so that's negative 2 times a, and then 0 and 0. So this immediately tells me that a is 2. So look at that. Sh really short calculation, making a strategic choice of x. We get the a value of 2 almost immediately. Now we can continue on taking other choices for x. Well, I want maybe now I want to solve for the b term. So the b involves the x and the x minus 2. It doesn't involve an x plus 2. That's in the other two terms. What makes x plus 2 vanish? x equals minus 2. So if I take x to be minus 2, plugging it into the left and the right hand side. So in the left hand side, that would be minus 2 squared, so that's 4. 4 times 4 is 16. 16 plus 6, 22. 22 minus 4 is 18. Is equal to minus 2 makes the a term go away. The b term becomes minus 2 times minus 3, so that's 6b. And the c term goes away, that's 0. So 18 is equal to 6b, or b is equal to 3. So again, another quick calculation, and we get the b term. And I could take x to b. Now the third choice to get c. c doesn't involve an x minus 1 term, so I can take x to be 1 and make the other two terms vanish. And so this becomes 4 minus 3 minus 4, so that's negative 3 is equal to c is 1 times 3, or c times 1 times 3, so that's 3c, or c is equal to negative 1. Okay, so that was method 2. Method 1 involved comparing coefficients, setting up a bunch of equations, and solving method 2, strategic choices for x, and we get the values of a, b, and c. Um, sometimes either of these methods are uh, suitable, and you can do both. In this case, I probably would have gone with method 2 at the start, because it seems like it would be a lot quicker. How do we know it would be a lot quicker? Well, at the start, up here, I can see every a, b, and c term have these uh, other factors, and for any one of those terms, the one involving a, b, or c, the other two involve a factor that's not in that one. So I can make a choice for x so that those two vanish and one survives. That's why I'd go with method two in this case. I can always make two vanish and make one survive by choosing x appropriately. Okay, so now we've got those values, and that means we can finish off the integral. 4x squared minus 3x minus 4 x cubed plus x squared minus 2x. What we've done here is just rewritten the integrand in a different way. 2 over x 
plus 3 over x plus 2 minus 1 over x minus 1 dx. So that equality, that was all of this work. All of this work here was to establish this equality. And this is our partial fraction decomposition. Decomposition. That's what this method is called, partial fraction decomposition. This was entirely a pre-calculus. Right? There, there was no calculus involved in doing this decomposition. It was taking a rational function and breaking it down in two parts, uh, these partial fractions. That was pre-calculus. Now is where the calculus comes in. I want to integrate it. Well, now I just need to integrate each of the partial fractions. And the integral of 2 over x is 2 ln of absolute value of x plus the next one is 3 ln of absolute value x plus 2 minus ln of absolute value of x minus 1 plus c. So there is our result. So the bulk of the work went into doing this decomposition, and we're just going to do a few more examples to get some practice with this. So let's look at this next example. And here's where we're focusing our attention right now trying to do this decomposition. x minus 1 cubed is equal to, and I have to figure out how many terms I'm going to decompose it into. Uh, so the first thing to know is degree of the denominator is, well, there's a cube and then a single x, so degree of the denominator is 4, the degree of the numerator is 3, and so the degree of the numerator is smaller, so there's none of this long division and splitting off a polynomial that we have to do. So what are my denominators going to be? Well, I have to imagine, what terms do I have to add together? Most general form, you know, what's the worst case scenario for all of these terms that I add together so that the denominator is x times x minus 1 all cubed? Worst case scenario, this thing's got to be the least common multiple of all the denominators I have here. So what has a least common multiple of x, x minus 1 cubed? Well, there had to have been one involving an x, otherwise it wouldn't have appeared in the, uh, the least common multiple. There has to be an 1 involving an x minus 1 to some power. It has to involve certainly 1 to a cube in order to get the cube there. But it could involve less. It could involve an x minus 1 or even possibly an x minus 1 squared. So don't forget about these two middle ones, that it could involve a term involving an x minus 1 or an x minus 1 squared. Because still, the least common multiple of these four denominators is still x, x minus 1 cubed. That's the worst case scenario is we have these middle terms involved as well. So the numerator here would be an a. We could have a b up here, a c up here, and a d up here. And now I need to find those values of a, b, c, and d so that we do get this decomposition. So again, we proceed as we did before. We clear denominators. So that becomes an a x minus 1 cubed plus a b x x minus 1 squared plus a c x x minus 1 plus a d times x. Now at this stage we have those two methods that we looked at before, comparing, expanding and comparing coefficients or making strategic choices of x to have can things cancel out. Now one of the issues you'll notice here is, suppose I wanted to, to make a strategic choice of x so that just the b term survives. So I'd want the a term to go away, so I need to take x to be 1. Oh, but when I do that, the b term would go away as well because there's an x minus 1 factor next to it. So we start to lose the ability in this case to make strategic choices to control exactly which ones vanish. Maybe at this stage, noticing that taking either x to be 0 or x equals 1 will only allow me to solve for d or a. The other ones will always vanish regardless, so I'll never get b or c. Maybe I should do the comparative coefficients. Or you could take some sort of hybrid approach where you do strategic choices of x and uh, you know x equals 0 and x equals 1, solve for two of the coefficients, and then do the expansion comparing coefficients to solve for the other two. You can, you can mix it up a little. What I'm going to do here is I'm just going to compare coefficients right from the start. So we're going to expand. That becomes an a. x minus 1 cubed is an x cubed minus 3x squared plus 3x minus 1 
plus b times x minus 1 squared, that's an x squared with the other x there, that's x cubed, minus 2x with another x there, that's a minus 2x squared, and then plus 1 times the x, that's a plus x. And then plus c x squared minus x plus dx. And so our terms are going to be a cube plus a square plus a linear thing plus a constant. Where are the x cubes coming from? Well, there's an a, there's a b, and that's it. Where are the x squareds coming from? There's a negative 3a, a negative 2b, and a plus c. Where are the x is coming from? There's a 3a, there's a b, there's a negative c, and there's a plus d. And the constants, there's only one constant, and it's a negative a. Now we're going to compare those coefficients with the ones on the left-hand side. So a plus b is the coefficient of x cubed. That has to be 1. The coefficient of x squared, there is no coefficient of x squared on the left side, so it must be 0. I should say there is no x squared on the left-hand side, so its coefficient must be 0. Um, what about the x? Well, that should be negative 4, and the negative a should be negative 1. So we immediately get from this that a is 1. So a is 1. What is b? Well, a plus b is 1, so that means b is 0. And then these two middle ones, the equations now become, so b is 0, a is 1, so I get negative 3 plus 0 plus c is 0, so c is 3. And the next one is 3a, so that's 3 plus b, which is 0, minus c, which is 3, plus d is negative 4, so d is negative 4. So there is our decomposition. And that means that our original integral, which we'll continue down here, is equal to the integral of 1 over x, b is 0, so the x minus 1 term actually wasn't needed in this case. But notice the x minus 2 squared term was. So that had a c on top, so that's plus 3 over x minus 1 squared plus d, which is negative 4, over x minus 1 cubed dx. So there's our new integrand, or our rewritten integrand, in terms of these partial fractions. Now we can anti-differentiate. That becomes ln of x. What about the next one? x minus 1 squared Well, on the, on the denominator. So that would have come from an x minus 1 on the bottom. You know, think of it this way. That's a negative 2 power on the x minus 1. So when you anti-differentiate it, it would have had a negative 1 power. And that should be a minus out front because now when I differentiate this, the x minus 1, you can think of it as a power of negative 1. The negative would come down, cancel, and make it into a plus. So that's that term. Where does the x minus 1 cubed uh, and the denominator integrate to? It's an x minus 1 squared. And that would, be, that would be a plus 2. So we've just integrated term by term in these cases. And in the last two terms, we've used the power rule. And then we've got a plus c on the end. And so there is our antiderivative. So let's look at the next example. So in this case, 5x cubed minus 3x squared plus 2x minus 1 all over. The denominator factors is x squared, x squared plus 1. So notice that this is an irreducible quadratic. We can't factor it into linear factors over the real numbers. So when we do the decomposition here, we're going to have terms who have to reassemble to give us this denominator. So we could have an x term. We could have an x squared term. In fact, we probably must have an x squared term in order to get the x squared term in the denominator there. 
we possibly have this x term. And we have an x squared plus 1 term. Now above the x term, the uh, numerator is going to be at worst 1 degree less than x, so it's going to be just a uh, constant. The x squared term, well, the numerator there is going to be worst degree 1 less than the irreducible part of it. So that's the x coming from the x term, so there's again a constant above it. This is a irreducible quadratic, so worst case scenario is we have a term that's degree 1 less than it. So this is the general pattern. You look at all of your your terms that you put on your denominators, and if the ones coming from the ones that are coming from linear terms, the x and the x squared, that's the linear term squared, you put constants up above. The one coming from the quadratic terms, you put linear things on top. Worst case scenario is that that's what happens. Now we clear denominators: 5x cubed minus 3x squared plus 2x minus 1, and this becomes a x times x squared plus 1 plus b x squared plus 1 plus c x plus d times x squared. Now at this stage we have a couple of methods to find these values of a, b, and c. Uh, one is to make these strategic choices for x so that things vanish. The other one is to um, expand and compare coefficients. Here since the x squared plus 1 factor doesn't have any zeros, it's irreducible. I can't really make a strategic choice that's going to make it disappear. So it might be a better idea just to go straight for comparing coefficients. So let's have a look. 3x squared plus 2x minus 1. So I expand things out to compare coefficients. Um, I'm going to get an x cubed term. Where is that going to come from? Well, there's an a there and a c coming from that one. So it's going to be an a plus a c plus the x squared terms. Where are those coming from? Well, there's a b and a d, so that's b plus d. And then we get the x terms. There's an a and no other x terms. And then a constant, which is just going to be the b. So we have then that a has to be 2, b has to be negative 1, b plus d has to be negative 3, a plus c has to be 5. Well, if I know that a is 2 and a plus c is 5, then that tells me that c is 3. b plus d is negative 3, but I know that b is negative 1, so d has to be negative 2. And so we'll say a is, maybe I'll just get rid of this to be more consistent how I've written it, a is 2 and b is negative 1. So there's our values. So there's our partial fraction decomposition, and so our integral then is the integral from, or the integral of 2 over x minus 1 over x squared plus 3x minus 2 all over x squared plus 1 dx. So now I go to work on this integral here. The first two can anti-differentiate. First one involves a logarithm. Second one involves a 1 over x. What about this third one? How can we do that? Well, it's a linear thing over a quadratic. The derivative of the top is not, I'm oh, sorry, the derivative of the bottom is not exactly the thing on top. So what can I do? Well, what I can do is I can split it up. Plus. 3x over x squared plus 1 minus 2 over x squared plus 1 dx. Why does that help? Well, now this piece can be obtained by using a substitution because the derivative of the bottom is now the top up to a constant. What about this piece? Well, it's a constant over x squared plus 1. That should scream to you arctan. So we split it up. We do a substitution on 1, so now we'll go ahead and do the antiderivatives. Minus, uh, what is it, 1 over x, so the derivative of that should be a plus, because the derivative of 1 over x is negative 1 over x squared, so we get that. 
Um, what's the antiderivative of this? Well, we can make a substitution, the substituting for the denominator, u equals x squared plus 1, and that gives us the numerator up to a constant. Um, go ahead and work through the details of that, and you can verify. I'm just going to sort of reverse engineer it here. I know that the antiderivative should be ln of x squared plus 1. If I take the derivative of this, the x squared plus 1 goes downstairs. Great. The derivative of the inside function becomes 2x. I want it to be a 3, so I need to multiply by a 3 halves. And how about the last one? Well, that would be minus 2 arc tan of x plus our constant of integration. And so there are the, there is the antiderivative. Let's have a look at this next example. So we've got 1, our integrand is 1 over x times x squared plus 1 squared. We want to decompose this. Again, we've got to think worst case scenario. What could we write it as a sum of so that the least common multiple is x, x squared plus 1 all squared? Again, x squared plus 1, that's irreducible. Well, how could I get an x? Well, there'd have to be a term with an x in it. How can I get an x squared plus 1 squared? Well, there'd have to be a term with an x squared plus 1 squared in it. But, worst case scenario, there could be one involving an x squared plus 1 term, because the least common multiple of all the three of these things is still x times x squared plus 1 all squared. So we definitely need this one. We definitely need this one. But there is a possibility that this one is in there as well. We don't know until we actually work out what the values of the numerators are. But again, the reason why the two on the end are needed is the least common multiple is, is the denominator that we need. The one in the middle, it's potentially needed, maybe not, is because the least common multiple of these three things is still the denominator that we need. So we go for the highest power, and then we have to consider all lower powers as well. There could be an a up here. Could be This is irreducible quadratic, so potentially a linear thing on top. And this is an irreducible quadratic to a higher power, so potentially a linear thing on top, so dx plus e. And I'm just going to get rid of these arrows to make a little bit more room for what we're going to write. And now we do the same thing we did before, expand, compare coefficients, and solve for a, b, and c. So that's bx plus c times x, x squared plus 1, and a dx plus e times an x. Okay, so let's expand. There's an a x to the fourth plus 2x squared plus 1 plus a b x cubed. Oh, I'm going to save that x out front. This little x here, I'm going to save it out front and then do the product of the other two. So that's bx cubed plus bx plus cx squared plus c plus dx squared plus e x. So if you're watching along here, the best way to do something like this is to just pause the video, do the calculation yourself, and then see that our answers agree, rather than trying to follow me step by step right now. Um, if you get stuck at some point, then just rewind and, and see what I was saying at the time that I wrote down the appropriate part that you messed up on. So this is going to be then, well, I can go ahead and try to figure out what the coefficients are. Something involving x plus a constant. Now what's the x uh, to the fourth power going to come from? Well, there's an a in the first one. There's a b x to the fourth, because of that x sitting out there. So that's a b. And that's it. What about the x cubed? Nothing there. There's a c x cubed here. So that's a c. That's it for that. What about the x squared? There's a 2a. There is a b. There is a d. What about the x's? There's a cx. And there's an ex. And then what about just the constants? There's an a. And that's it. So. We know then that a has to be 1, 
Comparing coefficients, this the on the left hand side, the only coefficient that's not the zero is the constant one. And that's, so that's a is one. Everything else has to be zero. So if that's going to be zero and a is one, then b has to be negative one. It has to be negative one. Make that a little bit more clear. B is negative one. C has to be zero. So C is zero. 2A plus B plus D. We know A is one, so that's two. B is negative one, so that's 2A plus B is one. One plus D is zero, so D has to be negative one. And C plus E is zero. C is zero, so E has to also be zero. So that means that our integral, so that's our decomposition, our integral becomes the integral of 1 over x plus bx plus c. c is 0, so that's negative x over x squared plus 1. dx plus e, d is negative 1, e is 0, so it's negative x over x squared plus 1 squared dx. So we've done our decomposition. Now we can go ahead and integrate piece by piece. This is ln of absolute value of x. This one's going to be ln of x squared plus 1. And what's the coefficient going to be? Well, when I take the derivative of this, the x squared plus 1 goes downstairs, multiply by the derivative of the inside, which is 2x. I don't want a 2x. I want a negative x. So I have to have a negative a half out front. What about the next piece? Well, I can think of this as x to the negative two, or x squared plus one to the negative two. You get that as a derivative of x squared plus one to the negative one. When I take the derivative of this thing, negative comes down front. Get a negative two as the exponent, so that takes care of the denominator. I have a negative out front. I got another two x that's coming out front, so I need a half in front deal with that and a plus c. So if you're worried about how I did these integrals here, do a substitution. You know, do a substitution and work out the details for yourself. What's the substitution? The substitution would be u is equal to x squared plus 1. And that's the same substitution you would use in this one as well. So in both cases you're going to do a substitution for u equals x squared plus 1. Okay, let's have a look at this example. Coming back to an application to finding a volume of a solid of revolution. Here we've got our function. And the interval we're interested in is 1 to 2. It's being revolved around the um, y-axis. Okay, so right there, around the y-axis. What are we going to use? Well, it looks like, based on the picture that's drawn there, that a vertical slice makes a cylinder, so this looks like the shell method that's being implied here. The shell method, so that means that the volume is equal to 2 pi times the integral from 1 to 2 of the radius of this arbitrary slice. So the radius is going to be the distance it is from the axis of rotation, so that's x, times the height, and that's given by the function value, x minus 9 x squared minus 3x dx. So there is our integral. It's a rational function. Now what we can see here is that it looks like degree of the top and the bottom are the same. They're both 2. But notice that x is a factor of the denominator. So we can actually simplify this. x can cancel and we're just left with an x minus 9 on top and an x minus 3 on the bottom. Now at this stage, we're looking at a rational function whose degree of the numerator is the same as the degree of the denominator. What we established before was that if we're going to apply this method of partial fraction decomposition, the degree of the numerator has to be smaller than the denominator to do that decomposition. If it's not, you do the long division first. Split off a polynomial, then look at a rational function involving a degree of the numerator smaller than the denominator, and then go to work on your decomposition. In this case, the degree of the numerator and denominator are the same. What can we do? Well, one thing we can do, we could go ahead and do the long division and all that, but it's actually equivalent to doing this. You look at the numerator and you say, well, okay, that's almost x minus 3. So I'm going to make it look like x minus 3 plus something else. 
what do I need to add to it? Well, if I add negative 6 to it, then I get back to the negative 9. Okay, so I'm just doing a, a little bit of rewriting. In fact, what I've done here is the long division with remainder. Uh, how many times does x minus 3 go into x minus 9? It goes in there once, and what's left over? Negative 6. So this is really the long division, but uh, I've done it in such a way that it doesn't look like it doesn't look very mechanical. It's it's just a bit of fiddling around with the numerator. So now at this stage, I can say, well, x minus 3 goes into the first term once. x minus 3 goes into the next one well, as a negative 6 over x minus 3. So now I've rewrite, rewritten the integrand in such a way that it's now straightforward to integrate. Antiderivative of 1 is x. Antiderivative of 6 over x minus 3 is 6 ln of absolute value of x minus 3. And that is from 1 to 2. And now we can plug in those values. That's 2 pi. 2 minus 6 ln of 2 minus 3, that's negative 1 absolute value, that's ln of 1, minus 1 plus 6 times ln of 2. ln of 1 is 0. 2 minus 1 is 1, so that's 2 pi times 1 plus 6 ln of 2. And so there's our result. Okay, so just a quick summary of the technique that we've done. We want to integrate a rational function. Something of the form p over q. And we're going to restrict our attention to the case when the degree of p is less than the degree of q. If it's not, then that's where you divide in, pull out the cofactor polynomial and the remainder term. And p would then be replaced with the remainder term, which is a smaller degree than q. Okay, so we're now at the stage where the degree of the numerator is smaller. What do you do? You factor the denominator into all its factors. You're going to have a bunch of linear factors. So there's a lot of subscripts and things written here, and I just want to point your attention to what are the important parts of this. There's a lot of detail here, and it's about how to read this. So it's a linear thing, raised to a power. Another linear thing, raised to a power, and so on. So dot, dot, dot means you've got a bunch of linear things raised to powers. Then you've got a bunch of quadratic things. Maybe I'll do this in another color. You've got a quadratic thing raised to a power, and a bunch of them. And finally, the last quadratic thing raised to a power. Now what do you do? Well, you split it up into a bunch of individual uh, rational functions, individual fractions, where, look at the first piece. It's a linear thing raised to the r1. How could that have come about? Well, you definitely need, do it blue again, blue blue indicating these are the linear things, you definitely need one that has the highest power possible, the r1. But, worst case scenario, you could have some of the lower powers of that same thing appearing. So that's that first line. It's just constants over the linear, th the linear parts all the way up to the highest power of the linear part that appears, the r1. That's the highest one. And you repeat. Do that for all the linear parts. So there's a dot, dot, dot. All the linear parts. And then, again, you definitely need that last one, because there is a linear part to the power of Rn, but you could have smaller ones as well. And again, these are, linear, these are all the linear parts, so the numerators are going to be all, of, all constants. Then you do the same thing for the quadratics. You definitely need a piece where the highest power of the first quadratic appears, that's the S1. And since it's an irreducible quadratic, worst case scenario is you have a linear thing on top. But you could have all the smaller powers as well. So S1 is your highest power, but you could have everything down to just a power of 1 of that same denominator. So this piece there is that whole next line. And then a dot, dot, dot. And then again your last quadratic. You definitely need the one of the highest power, SM. You're going to have to have a Linear term on top, worst case scenario. But you could have all of the smaller powers of that same denominator. Okay, now once you've got this all written out, now it's a matter of solving for these uh, coefficients, these a's and b's and c's. Now at that stage, what we've been doing is expanding, comparing coefficients, setting up a collection of equations and solving. Now once you come up with a set of equations, that is a very mechanical process to solve those things. At this stage, though, with being in Math 152, you might not have the tools that allow you to do 
the equations in, uh, you know, with more than, let's say, five variables or six variables uh, by hand in an effective way. But that's where you take tools from linear algebra, Math 232, Math 240. The tools developed there are precisely the tools you need to solve these large collections of linear equations. So you may be thinking, well, okay, I could get a lot of equations and a lot of unknowns, and it would take a long time to do these calculations of these coefficients by hand. And the answer is yes, yeah, it probably would. But with the tools from linear algebra, 232 and 240, you can see how quickly it can be done on a computer. So that would be the kind of thing you would throw into a computer algebra system and have it calculate these values of all these a, b's, and c's. So the point is, is at that stage, it's very mechanical, algorithmic. A computer can solve this problem at that stage. What you just need to know is that there are tools available to do this mechanical solution process. So coming back to the original problem, we've now got a collection of functions, these rational functions, which we have a method for integrating any one of them that works, no matter what the rational function is. You take your rational function, you factor the denominator into linear and quadratic factors, you write down a partial fraction decomposition, it could be really huge, this decomposition can be really big, but a computer could do the solution of these coefficients rather easily and effectively, mechanically. It's a mechanical algorithmic process. So you can do that, you can solve these things, and then integrate term by term. And so that is completely solvable. Integration of rational functions is a completely solvable problem. All right, so that's it for this section. Thanks very much for watching, and we'll see you again next time.